Uh, it's good to be here. I want to thank HUD for inviting me uh, this year, and I'm happy I could make it down here. The talks have been great, and so I'm going to perhaps go in a slightly different direction today and talk about the translation of therapies to patients and the challenges in doing that. We've heard a lot of good science, but in, in the end, what does a good science mean when you don't really treat anyone or you can't get it there? And there are a lot of complexities, particularly in the rare disease area, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I, after working for Biomarin for 11 years, I decided to form a foundation to focus on fixing the, the development process. And while you'll hear many people talk about the, you know, the valley of death and all the various other issues with regard to drug development, uh, I wanted to put together a campaign that would focus on what I thought were the critical areas of clinical development that are uh, challenging for rare diseases and see if we could find some ways to improve policy and therefore allow, accelerate the investment in development of treatments. We established what we call the Cure the Process campaign, and these goals are shown here. Basically, it was trying to get more specialized reviewers within FDA that would be um, uh, have greater experience and knowledge in, the, in these complex and rare disease areas. And we wanted to help improve access to accelerated approval using surrogate markers, which for some diseases may be the only way you could do effective drug development. Finally, we wanted to improve both the study design and the analyses that could be used to um, search for the approval of a, of a drug. And currently, the paradigm in drug development is based on large market disorders, with single endpoints, and very simplistic look at how diseases are uh, manifest themselves, but in these rare diseases, they're much more complex. There's multiple domains involved. We need to think more creatively about how to manage the drug development and clinical study process. So uh, today we have now reached 175 or more uh, actually patient and physician organizations that have endorsed our campaign formally, and we are actually uh, have people from around the world now supporting us. So what I'm going to talk about more specifically today are um, what the challenges in translation, and I want to focus on first the question, are there treatments with promise that are not translated to the clinic? That is, are there examples that will show that, in fact, things aren't going so well? While we're hearing about some great work today in alkaline phosphatase deficiency or um, hypophosphatasia, there's certainly, it's taken time for a lot of diseases to get treatments, even though there have been some excellent data in the past. The question also then is, what, what are some of the causes of this problem? And I want to show you some data looking at what it takes to invest in and get, develop a therapeutic to understand what the barrier is, the financial barrier, which actually is a, at the core of what a lot of what we do. And finally, we'll talk about what we think we could improve, at least in one aspect of the development pathway that would have important impacts on investment and translation of therapeutics. So uh, to, uh, to do this look at what was out there and what was maybe stalled in development. I uh, had an intern, uh, Brigitte Miyamoto, uh, work on a program to search for diseases that had excellent animal treatment data published but hadn't reached patients and try to find as many of those as we could. Now, it's very, very, very difficult to get every possible area. And we ended up having probably some more emphasis on the biochemical genetics area just because that's what we're more familiar with. We did our best to come up with what was a list of 16 uh, treatments, and we started looking at what would the cost of development would be if you used a clinical endpoint or if you used a surrogate endpoint, and just looked at kind of devising clinical development programs and what their costs would be like. The poor purpose of this is that most companies do that before they decide to invest, and the idea is what, do, what is the company going to look at when they look at these things and decide, are we going to invest in this rare disease or are we going to pass? So we did identify 16. I'm not going to tell you what they are yet, but we are, the data is submitted and hopefully will come out soon. But we, we showed that they had good animal model data. There were some challenges in translation. Some of the diseases were very small, very rare. Some, some cases they were related to uh, very difficult to treat tissues or very difficult to evaluate tissues, such as the you know, brain, bone, or others. So uh, what we did then is for each disease that we found that we had a good model data, we developed three clinical programs. One would be a, a two-study program where you do a phase one, two study and a phase three study, and you, and you would use a clinical endpoint. And we'd have to define a clinical endpoint for each of those diseases. We then developed a model for a surrogate endpoint with two trials, in which we'd have to do then a phase four commitment study. And we also did a surrogate where we did only one study, straight to the, a single pivotal study, 
and then do a, a follow-up in a phase four study. So there are three approaches to development. It's very hard to do the single study strategy, but there are a few products that have been approved that way. And the idea was, let's look at the cost of doing this with the particular clinical endpoints in mind, design the studies, power the studies, and figure out what the costs would be. And so what we did, and we showed that if you look at the mean cost to launch, this doesn't, doesn't mean commercial cost, it's the cost of doing toxicology, putting it in the clinic, doing the drug development, getting approval. For, for the, the average here was like $90 million, in fact, to do that process based on the way it's done today. That's, that's a real number, because for Aldurazine, which I worked on, we spent over that. For Naglazine, we spent about that. Um, that's shocking, right? Uh, Aldurazine, we had 130 million, and there's 200 patients on therapy right now in the US. It's not feeling right, right? I think most of you are thinking that's kind of insane, yes. Um, if we, if we used a, two, if we used two, a surrogate driven study, you'd cut the cost to 40 million. If you were able to do it in one study, down to 28, which is still a lot of money, but maybe, maybe more reasonable. So you could get a 62% decrease in the amount of money you'd have to spend. And this is really important because it starts to affect whether people make the decision they're gonna work on a rare disease or not. And if you look at something called net present value, that's to figure out if I launch a product and I charge whatever, an expensive price for it, and I figure out, is this gonna make sense as a business? What we can show is that net present value was, was only 23 million, and many of, the, many of them actually had a negative pre net present value, that is, there was no, no um, value to it. Um, but this went up now uh, threefold. But the, the important thing you must realize here is this is the kind of thing that companies do when they try to decide, are we gonna do this program or not? So the more costly development is, the more difficult it is, the more time it takes, the less likely they're gonna invest so with, with that information, to put it another way, what we showed is that if you took current clinical endpoint driven designs with a billion dollars in hand, whoever's billion it is, yours, us, a company's, you'd get 11 drugs done. But if you, if you improved it and got only, if you're able to do one steady surrogate, smartly done, you, you could get 36 drugs done. So what the point is not that these surrogates are the right answer, but that the fact is that there's a huge value in getting better at using markers and surrogates for these kind of programs, a very big value to us as a society. So one of the questions you might ask is, well, how do we know that that's really having an impact on what's going on? And we decided early on to hire a firm to analyze who's doing drug, who's filing orphan drug designations, what are they getting approved? And what do they look like as companies to give you an idea of what it takes to get a drug approved? And one of the first things we looked at, and we showed this actually um, last year, was that if you look at orphan designations, they've been rising dramatically over the last 12 years. And, but approvals overall have been staying pretty flat. Now, of course, there might be a delay between the approval and designation, but the truth is it hasn't really changed that much over those 20 years, even though there's a, in, an increase in what you assume is development pressure. For ultra-rare disorders, those are less than, in fact, less than 6,000, which are all the diseases we've been talking about today. You can see that, in fact, the same pattern is happening. So now if you look at designations, what you can say there's been about 157 in these last 12 years from 143 different organizations. But if you look at companies who are focused, focused on the ultra rare space, it's, it's about you know, 40, 41 of them. So it's about one fourth of those designations are from basically des focused companies on that area. Now let's, let's look at approvals because this is what's enlightening. Of 32 approvals in the ultra rare category, you know, 28 from 28 different organizations, only five were from companies focused on ultra rare disorders. So the majority are from companies who do other things, who have one, one rare disease drug. And what's, what's interesting here is that three of those were from my company, Biomarin. So only, only another couple companies had one approval each in 12 years that were focused on rare diseases. So already you're getting a feeling that, wow, well, companies can't seem to make it if they're focusing on rare diseases by alone. Now, Novia is probably right there now with their, their program. Now here's the interesting thing. If you look at the financials of who gets approved and who just has designations but hasn't gotten an orphan approved, what you find is that companies with approval have an, are assets about a billion, over a billion dollars on average. 
where it's companies that are just filing designations but haven't gotten approval only worth 100 million, one tenth. You look at how much cash is on board, companies who achieve approval, they have an average of 500 million in cash in, in their hands. So that's telling you something about what it takes to get through the process. And that's lining up with what I just told you about how much it costs to the drug development. And you see all those numbers line up. But if you imagine if you only have 78, you, you can't actually fund the whole thing. You end up not actually making it or you end up getting stalled. Now this is one example where we could drive, it's very hard to get development costs. That is, we can only estimate them because companies usually don't publish them. And based on our, my own knowledge on enzyme replacement therapy, it usually costs around 250,000 a year per patient to do an enzyme replacement trial. It varies in how much the enzyme costs and everything else, but the cost of infusions, the site, monitoring, the rest of it. In the early days, Sarah days, they did a single pivotal trial, got approved, and had what we estimate would be about four million. This is only clinical development. That's not the cost of manufacturing, because that product was very more costly to manufacture because of the way it was made. But since then, the, the costs for the tri development programs alone have gone up. In fact, you know, Elaprase were estimating like $100 million in development costs. Again, only about 300 patients in the United States on the therapy. So that just gives you, an, you know, a grasp of what's the scale and magnitude of the problem. And the other F factor is time. In the early days, about three years for the Gaucher product, but since then it's been more on the five to five plus year range for drug development. Again, driving up costs, but also delaying the ability to get cash, meaning you have to have more cash on board in order to survive that period. So the question is with that, the difficulty and with the, the value of getting, being able to use biomarkers and surrogates that are reasonable and scientifically sound, what can we do to try to improve development and be able to get um, more access to accelerated approval pathway? And I want to talk a little about the Aldurazyme story again in this context with regard to surrogate endpoints because it's an example of a type of endpoint, a metabolic substrate endpoint, which I think makes rational sense but was very hard to get agreement on at the regulatory level. So Aldurazyme is an enzyme and it's an enzyme replacement therapy for a disorder called MTS1. And this uh, lysosomal storage disorder, basically they accumulate these bubbles of, of sugar-like material in your lysosomes, and it enlarges the liver and spleen, and it spills out into the urine. And we can measure that as a way of determining how much storage they have, how much of the sugar has been built up. So we can measure how big their liver and spleen are with an MRI, and we can take their urine and see how much substrate. And we showed in the dog that we could reduce these surrogates and improve the pathology of the dog also improve the clinical uh, outcome of the dog. And we showed that the increased urine correlates with greater clinical severity in patients, that if you look at mild patients, they have very low levels, and if they're severe, they have high levels. So it looked like a strong relationship. But we had no real clinical treatment data that we could rely on. And we did the clinical study here, and this is 10 patients treated over six months, and we could show the size of the liver in these patients, which was very high, came down into the normal range. And the urinary sugar levels, which were very high, came down 80% toward the normal range. And these were very strongly significant results, but they couldn't be accepted by us because there wasn't any experience clinically, and they didn't know how well it predicted, how much decline meant how much benefit. Well, how is anyone going to have this kind of information for a rare disease? You almost never have it. And so we ended up doing another study, which was a phase three study, and in this study, we showed that the force vital capacity, how much air you can blow out of your lung, increased with the drug and it didn't increase with the placebo. And we showed how far you can walk in six minutes, increased uh, in, in the treated patients, but did not increase in the placebo patients. And we showed in parallel that the urine gag, which actually went up in the placebo treated patients, went nicely down in the, um, in the, untreat in the treated patients. So we showed the nice substrate relationship in the study. But it's complicated, and this is what I want to show you about. The complications we all have is that we have are mistaken in our view of how surrogate is supposed to work. We think the surrogate somehow is to be one-to-one -one relationship between some clinical parameter. But it's not going to be one-to-one. -one. So we as scientists and others have to understand these, these surrogates are not going to be a perfect one-to-one -one relationship. And we have to understand how to interpret them And once we start understanding that. So I want to show you how confusing it gets and show you why in fact, sometimes the surrogates are better than the clinical. So uh, one of the things we did in the study is we looked at 
how many, we plotted how much your urine sugar, we call gag, went down versus how much you walked. In other words, if your substrate went down a lot, did you walk a lot further? That's what you'd expect. And in fact, if you look at the, the open circles here are treated patients, there are 15 patients where the sugar went down in the urine, excuse me, and the walk distance improved. There's no, there's no placebo patients in that quadrant, all right? So only treated patients reach that. But there's a few patients here who are, who are treated patients whose walking got worse. And so it looks messy. Why do those four people walk worse? Obviously, the sugar did not predict what happened to their walking. And so we, we make conclusion the sugar is no good. Well, the sugar is actually the substrate was perfectly right. The problem was these diseases are complicated. And some of these patients were actually having core compression symptoms because we improved their mobility so much that their necks became unstable and they started having core compression symptoms. Is that an adverse effect or a adverse effect of a beneficial effect? So th that creates some complexity in how do you interpret what's happening. So it looks less perfect. You don't see a nice perfect line here. You see groups of patients. Well, if you look at individuals, and this is after three and a half years of treatment, you can see that the children individually walk better, the vast majority, and the adults actually walk better. These are the more severe patients, the mild pa severe patients early in their course, mild patients in the middle of their course. But the adolescents who are more severe patients but more advanced, that is they had 12, 15 years to get really a severe joint disease, had difficulty walking, those patients, have, many of them walked worse. But many of them turn out to have this core compression problem because they were so advanced by the time they got treated that their course was complicated. But you might say, well, that's, that's a nice excuse, Dr. Kakis, but that, what, that, how, what's the proof of that? Well, just to show you, look at these adolescents' range of motion. Look how much they improved their shoulder range of motion. So these guys could not move their arms, and now they can move their arms. Look here. Uh, some of them, 60, 70 degrees improvement in the range, right? Okay, so they had dramatic improvements in their shoulder range of motion. And the reason is they were severely restricted at the beginning. These kids were so tight and their bones so damaged, but, but the range of motion improved a lot. So in this case, the substrate reduction helped their function. But because of the neck instability, which is also an improvement in range of motion of the neck, they ended up with some instability, all right? So now you can see the complication. So what does urine gag, what does that sugar measure sorry, really predict? You want it to predict six minute walk test? You want it to predict shoulder range of motion? What do you want it to predict? What is the clinical outcome? The truth is our evaluation of the clinical outcome is very weak, incomplete, and then we, we draw conclusions that are incorrect. The truth is my commitment, my point to you would be that the urine gag is actually a better measure of what's going on in any patient and that the clinical things are very complicated depending on where you are in the course. So to understand that, if you take someone early in the course here, before they have a lot of disease and their total health is high, you're not going to see much improvement because there's not much disease yet to treat. If you take someone later down, they have much more difference from normal here, right? So you can get a much bigger effect. But this might be what you'd call the treatment effect off their expected course. And this might be the amount of treatment they could have gotten if the treatment was perfect, right? We don't know what that number is. But there's some part of this differential from normal that is irrecoverable, irreversible, right? But we never know what that is. In this case, the kids whose vertebral bones were completely damaged, there's no way for us to fix that. It's, all, it's too late in those particular patients. Now, let me put this into a, another way of looking at it, another com complicated way of looking at it, but bear with me and you'll understand it. Let's assume now we're doing a clinical study, as we do in these rare diseases, where we have five-year-olds, right? And we have someone who's maybe 18, 15 years old, and we have someone who's 30 years old. When we, by the way, in our studies had five to 40-year-olds in the Aldersheim study. Five to 40-year-olds in the same clinical study using a six-minute walk test. All right, so already you know what the challenges are. Now, if you look at the disease course, if you look at something which I call clinical reversible disease, if you have a severe disease, your disease gets worse very quickly and reaches a peak, at which point you start accumulating irreversible disease where it's now too far gone, you can't go back. And that declines and, and ultimately the child may pass away. Now, if you're intermediate, the rate of increase may be slower and you reach a peak somewhat later and may have more reversibility later on, whereas a mild patient may be getting worse much more slowly. 
Now, let's say you take any three of these patients at age five in a study. What you'd find is that the, the young patients who are early in their course may have a very nice effect. The intermediates might have some effect. The milds have no effect because they're not that sick yet. But the metabolic marker will actually be consistent. And so the, if you take it now a teenager, what you'll find is, okay, the, the severe patients on the back end of their course now, so much less treatable disease, they're much more irreversible, and the, in the uh, intermediate patients now at a peak. Now, if you go ahead and take a patient here in their 30s, you might find the mild patient actually has the best outcome at that age, whereas the intermediate patient is starting to lose ground, and the older patient, if there was any, couldn't survive. But the metabolic marker might actually show you the same result in all three patients, because you're fixing them to the same degree. Depending on where you are in your course and your severity, you get a different pattern. So if you now run a study with these three patients in them, these three groups of patients in the same study, what do you get? All kinds of confusion about what's happening, right? It looks very complicated. That's what's going on. That's why we're having trouble understanding it. But if you brought to me a patient with MP1 and you wanted to figure out how well they're doing on enzyme therapy, I will ask one question is what is their urine gag reduction? Because the only way I can tell roughly how your biochemical replacement's going. What I can tell you, the only kids that have survived long term and done really well had very low urine gags and none of them had any antibodies. So those are the ones that were the long-term survivors on enzyme replacement therapy. So my point to you would be the metabolic surrogates are not a compromise. So I'm taking the hard line here. The hard line is it's not just let's make it easy. What I'm saying to you, actually sometimes the metabolic surrogates are better. They're better at telling what's going on with your drug. It's better at determining what the dose should be and whether you're doing the right thing for the patients and that they, they sh can be very much better than clinical because the clinical endpoints are variable, hard to measure, and complicated by the stage and irreversibility of the disease when you study. And because they're so variable, you have very little power to tell what's going on, and therefore you, you will miss things. Like one of the things we talk about is antibodies. Antibodies do impact enzyme replacement, but all the analyses using clinical endpoints don't discover any effect of the antibodies. So people say there's no effect. Well, that's not true. There is an effect. The problem is the clinical uh, variable, the clinical endpoints are so variable that they have no power to detect the difference. But the, but the urine substrate, by the way, show it very nicely. The metabolic endpoints are far more sensitive, they're reliable, and they actually, I think to date, there's been an increasing amount of data showing that in lysomal diseases, they will predict clinical outcome, including recently in Pompeii disease, where long-term outcome in infantile Pompeii was related to how much urinary substrates coming out. So I think those, and that's a muscle disease. So what we think needs to happen is we need to start talking about this and start to understand what the science really looks like. Get away from big market cholesterol and arrhythmia in, in, uh, in heart disease and all these other situations where surrogates have failed and start thinking scientifically about what biochemically makes sense and how do we qualify a surrogate so we can do studies. And what we need to do is figure out what those criteria are so we can be confident that we're picking reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit type surrogates that we think we understand what they're doing. I don't think it's going to be easy. I, don't, I think it is going to be challenging, but I think it's something we need to do. And I think we'll have a big effect. Now, all year we've been working in Washington. There's been a lot of activities in Washington looking at not only this, but other things. And Dr. Collins certainly had a number of initiatives, and you heard some of that from, from Steve today. And certainly there's a rare disease report from the Institute of Medicine, which I would recommend you take a look at. But probably more importantly, the Brown and Brack Brown Amendment uh, has been uh, in place since it was in the 2010 FDA appropriation bill. And what that amendment said to the FDA is to evaluate your rare disease policies, form a committee and evaluate it, and write a report to Congress and tell us what you think you could improve, and then implement those approvals. Well, that's happening this year in March. We'd like to see what, what's going to happen. So with that report, it should be coming out in March. And what we'd, we're, be doing, we're going to be doing during the year is running workshops to help look at some of the issues on both in statistical analysis, evaluation of clinical endpoints, as well as a workshop three probably later in the, in the fall on surrogate endpoints. What we hope to do is then work with the FDA on improving either policy, guidances, or whatever else would happen would be needed to try to implement improvements in this area. The FDA is also conducting, I, I saw a workshop and on spinal muscular atrophy, looking at a qualifying marker endpoints, because they realize the problem and they are working at it, and we appreciate their focus on doing that. So the workshop series will be looking at any aspect of both clinical development and surrogate markers, 
uh, as well as clinical evaluation, and we're, we have a couple of them coming up. Um, and uh, my time is probably done. But the th workshop three, which will happen in the fall, I will point out to you, we'll be looking at metabox uh, endpoints or surrogate endpoints. And the idea is let's figure out let's figure out how to do this reasonably and come up with some answers so we can help reduce the time it takes and the investment required to get more of these rare diseases treated. So we do need your support, and I think one of the things is from experts in the field, we need examples of where metabolic or surrogate markers are useful and are predictable, and also examples where they're not, so we can use those to test, as test cases for any criteria we might work on. It could be we do this disease by disease, that, that is what the FDA is doing right now, but I'd rather develop a policy that's a little broader than that, that deals with more than just one disease and helps us as a, as a country start to focus our efforts on getting treatments developed and not just stalled and published only. So that's it for today. Um, I want to thank the certainly people at my foundation, uh, Brigitte Miyamoto, the intern that worked, and my other foundation supporters who have, uh, uh, employees and supporters who have uh, helped us get to where we are. And I thank you for listening. Well, first of all, I, that's not what I, the point I made is that the adolescent patients have a very good effect. It's just that their walking got worse, but a lot of the other symptoms got better. Each person had different, in fact, we did a, a multi-domain analysis, which I didn't show, I showed you last time, a multi-domain analysis showing that different patients had improvement in different domains that just varied on where you were in your disease state. But let's talk about the question of why don't you just select patients, right? Well, to do the 45 patient study, we went to six countries to find 45 patients who could qualify for the study. So that already tells you the problem. There's only a couple hundred total now after eight years on the market in the United States on therapy, after eight years. So the truth is that a few hundred more. So it's, it's extremely hard to put the studies together and you end up having to have wide inclusion criteria because you can't do a study. And uh, if you narrow the inclusion criteria, by the way, what happens to you at the regulatory level is they say, well, you haven't treated this group, you haven't treated that group, so now you need to do another study for that group. And so you only end up uh, in more problems. And we, we end up doing a study for under five because it's very hard to do a walk test and force vital capacity on three-year-olds. Um, so you end up having to do the young patients as a separate study. But this is, this is the general problem. You just have to take a wide variety of patients, otherwise you can never enroll in the studies. So, this is partly where the need for surrogates become important. So that you, what I really believe you should be doing is taking all comers into studies, so you get experience treating everyone, and then we subset the analysis based on their clinical condition and what clinical endpoints are relevant, and use the markers to help us tell overall how the population is getting treated with the drug, and use the clinical endpoints to help establish where is the clinical benefits important and when they're not, and develop a label for the product out of that. We're not there yet. That's a, a total paradigm shift from what we're doing. But truthfully, that's really the smart answer. Treat everyone, analyze the data, and figure out how to improve how we analyze the data so you end up with an answer that makes sense. So my, my sense is the FDA is, is really the obstacle here and, and the rules that, that they have to a large extent. Is that, is that right? Well. I'd hate to call them the obstacle. They're, they're sort of implementing the policy they think we've asked for, and the question is that some of the policies are based on large market drugs, and they're not, they don't function as well for us. They're interested in improving it. They've assigned a new associate director of rare diseases. They're starting to respond to the issues at hand. So I think they're interested in improving what they're doing, but I think the challenge is there's just too much precedent in history that makes it hard for them to adapt. And partly it has to do with the fact that they've been hammered by Congress over things that have come through that had trouble, right? Sure. But none of those things were rare disease drugs, by the way. They're all common disease drugs. So I think they should be able to compartmentalize their response to obesity drugs be different from, you know, uh, MPS-1 in terms of how they respond. And I think that's what we need to come up with. 
And I think in the end, maybe the society does have to go to Congress and say, look, why don't we establish what we want in terms of our controls and regulations, what we really want as a society, and decide what safety risks, what, what issues we're going to take and we want to take so, so that we can get this done. So do you think there'll be a time when you sort of issue a call for all the rare disease advocates to, to get together, right, their Congress people, et cetera, to, to really mobilize this? I mean, do you well, there may be a up? point in time. There may be a point in time where the FDA needs the support of Congress with regard to legislation that improves the process and basically gives the FDA cover and protection that they can change policies without getting uh, the next day called into Congress and, and critiqued. Right? So in some ways, that's sort of the problem and the dynamic right now. So I think there's a value percent perhaps in a, and some people have considered whether there's an additional Orphan Drug Act Part 2, like an added on that would look at what are these changes and provide cover to, to FDA to make those changes um, with the support of Congress. And I think there's a point at time where we might need everyone's support. If you're interested, you can sign on our website and become uh, and get updates, and we will send out calls for letters and and uh, support when they are needed. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much.